You are listening to the Cookbook Love Podcast with Maggie Green, episode number 262. Welcome to the Cookbook Love Podcast, a podcast that celebrates cookbook readers, buyers, collectors, writers, and clubs. And now your host, cookbook author, culinary dietitian, and cookbook writing coach, Maggie Green. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Cookbook Love Podcast. How's everybody doing today? I'm excited to be here with an interview with Grace Lin, author of the new book, Chinese Menu. But before we get started, if you are an aspiring cookbook writer who wants to share your recipes and stories in a print cookbook, but you wonder all the things, like if you have enough to put a book together, if your book would ever sell, if you should self or traditionally publish, if you need to know how to format the book, or if you would even captivate readers, then I'd like to invite you to next week's cook- Cookbook Curious live question and answer call. During this call, I will answer all your questions about recipes, formatting, profitability of writing a cookbook, and different cookbook publishing paths. So I do hope you'll join me. Head on over to www.cookbookwritersacademy.com slash curious to register for this free live question and answer call. And I hope to see you there. Today on the podcast, I have an interview with Grace Lynn. Grace is an award-winning New York Times bestselling author and illustrator of picture books, early readers, and middle grade novels, including her Newbery Honor novel, Where the Mountain Meets the Moon, as well as a Caldecott Honor picture book called A Big Mooncake for Little Star. In 2016, Grace's art was displayed at the White House, and she was recognized as a champion of change for Asian American and Pacific Islander art and storytelling. Today on the podcast, we meet Grace. We get to listen to her storytelling as we discuss her recently published book, Chinese Menu, which tells the myths and legends behind your favorite Chinese restaurant dishes and what actually makes this food American. This podcast is a real treat because you'll not only get to hear the storytelling and the legend that Grace legends that Grace has published, but also her recommendations for the best cookbooks for recreating Chinese restaurant favorite dishes at home. So without further delay, let's dive into this interview with Grace Lynn. Hi, Grace. Welcome to the Cookbook Love Podcast. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm so excited that you're here. Can't wait to share about your book, Chinese Menu, the history, myths, and legends behind your favorite foods. But before we dive in, why don't you tell everybody a little bit about who you are and what you do? Sure. So uh, I'm Grace Lin, and most people know me as a children's book author and illustrator. I've actually been publishing children's books for quite a long time. Uh, My first book was published in 1999. Uh, and it was called The Ugly Vegetable. So you can see I've always been kind of interested in food right from the (laughs) get-go. Yes. So um, what is it about children's books? Why don't you tell everybody, what is it like to write a children's book? What makes it different from the type of book that we're going to talk about today? Sure. So I love children's books, and I'm often asked, oh, when are you going to write an adult book? And, you know, the truth is that when I think about the books that I love and still loved as a child and love now, I realize they're the same books. Like the books that have made the most impact on me were the books that I read as a child. And honestly, when I talk to most people, it's the same thing. The book they remember the most or that made the most impact on them is the book that they've read as a child. And as an author, I guess that's just so tantalizing to feel like, oh, maybe I could make a book that could mean that much to someone. And so uh, that's really one of the main pulls for me for children's books. I just feel like I want to create something that really means something to a person. And uh, it seems like children's books is the way that does it. Yeah. And, you know, children's books, uh, my experience with them was just mainly in uh, ones I read when I was young or were read to me. And then also books that we read to our children when they were young 
But the thing about them is you don't have like a one and done relationship with children's books that they love. You read them over and over and over and over again. And if you check them out from the library, maybe you might check them out again and uh, And again and again and again. again, (laughs) Right. So I think that is a, a fascinating way for children to get exposed to reading and books, even if it's through the reading of the same thing multiple times, like their favorite books. Yeah. Well, you know, I I like to say that I think children's books are one of humanity's greatest treasures, because when you think about it, the things that we are trying to pass down, the values, the things, the customs, those are the things that we put in our children's books, because that's what we want them to treasure. So the things that we treasure as humanity are in our children's books. So what was the, uh, the concept about with the ugly vegetable? The Ugly Vegetables is actually a story about me and my mother um, that when I was growing up, it's based on a true story. When I was growing up, uh, I grew up in upstate New York where there was no other um, um, Asian families, no other uh, marginalized families in town. We were the only Asian family in town. And she would grow Chinese vegetables in her garden because she couldn't purchase them anywhere, uh, while everybody else in the neighborhood would grow flowers. And I used to be really, mm. really embarrassed. And I'd be like, why are we growing these ugly vegetables? And so uh, the story has a happy ending, don't worry. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. And I think something that uh, I wasn't always aware of about children's books, and you can um, correct me if this isn't true, is that is it common for the author to illustrate their own book or not? It's not really, honestly, Um, though, I mean, much more common than, say, in adult books, obviously. Right. Uh, But uh, there's there are plenty there are plenty of books that are authored by one person and illustrated by another person. And I would actually say that two thirds of the of the books in in, uh, the world are probably that way. But there there is a strong a strong section, a strong uh, part that is authored and illustrated. So it's not rare. It's okay. just not the norm. <laughs> okay. Okay. And in your situation, um, did you do both for your children's books? I know that you did the artwork for this current book that we're going to talk about today, but what about your children's books? Yes. I'm actually both an author and an illustrator. I actually started as an illustrator. Um, and what happened was that uh, I kept sending in samples of my artwork, which obvi- actually always featured my family, my mom, my dad, my sisters growing up. And um, editors would say, I really like your artwork, but I can't find any stories to go with them. Uh, Because back then, um, stories about Asian Americans were were fairly rare. And so uh, I actually found myself um, taking writing classes and learning how to write so that I could illustrate. (laughs) Yes, you'd write your own books and then you could illustrate those as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What do you like better, the writing or the illustrating? Um, <laughs> because if you had an audience of kids, I wouldn't say this, but because I know you don't have an audience yes. of kids, I'll say, I don't really like either. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's I what don't... happens when you write books. It's like, I don't know why I'm even, I'm just teasing. It's like, I don't really I, know why I'm doing yeah, this. I don't really like writing or illustrating, but I do love telling stories. Yes. Honestly, I love telling stories. And for me, the story is the most, um, is the most rewarding part. And if to tell that story, uh, I need to write and use words, then I will do that. If to tell that story, it's better to draw pictures, I will do that, whatever serves the story best. So uh, because that's really what I love. Yeah. And you know, the story that you just told about growing up in a neighborhood, and everybody's growing flowers, and your mother's growing ugly vegetables, because she wants to cook with them, and she doesn't have access to them at the supermarket, because She has to grow those because that's what you, she's used to cooking. I mean, just that simple story already told us a lot about who you are and the things that were important to you and to your mom and to uh, your family. And it's amazing to me that stories are so individual, but yet so universal Um, and Um, that it's, it's such a beautiful way to connect with people and to learn about who we are. Uh, through the simple uh, act of telling a story or drawing a story, like you said, whichever way you go about it. Yeah, it's such an important part of us. I mean, when I think about when I go to funerals or when we go, when we think about our loved ones, 
um, it's always the stories. It's like, oh, who has a story about so-and-so, so-and-so, right? That's how we remember people. That's how people make an imp impression on us. That's what we hold dear when people are away from us is their, the stories. That's right. That's right. And um, it is a time when we're remembering people. Uh, stories is what we always tell. Funny stories, uh, touching stories, things that make us uh, remember them in a in a certain way. And I know in our family, sometimes we're always like telling the same stories over and over again about certain relatives. It's like almost like they become the story. And I know that their exactly. life and who they were was so much bigger than that story, but it's just funny things that we remember and have attached to them that we just tell all the time. Which yes, because their memory is encapsulated in it. It's just wonderful. I think, that's right. and that's why I love stories so much. Yeah, yeah. And that ties in perfectly then to the book that you have uh, just, well, you've written it. It's just released, The Chinese Menu, The History, Myths, and Legends Behind Your Favorite Foods. So let's talk a little bit about this book. Uh, what Give us a synopsis of what the book is about and uh, why you wanted to write these stories. So uh, this book is all about the dishes that you might eat at a uh, at a Chinese restaurant here in the United States, and it tells the myth and the legend or the origin story behind each of those uh, foods. Now, the reason why I wanted to write this book, uh, it goes all the way back to 2004. Um, I wrote and illustrated a picture book, a book for kindergartners and first graders called Fortune Cookie Fortunes. And it, like I said, it was just for kindergartners and first graders, but I researched the fortune cookie. And that's when I found out that the fortune cookie is a completely American invention. That if you go to China, Nobody knows what you're talking about if you ask them for a fortune cookie. Or if they do know what you're talking about, they will say, oh, you mean the American cookie, right? So um, I told this li little interesting factoid to a lot of my friends and colleagues, and each one of them replied to me the same kind of thing. They'd say, oh, so fortune cookies aren't even really Chinese? And that really bothered me because, um, as I said earlier, like I'm, I'm, uh, I was born here in the United States, but I have an Asian heritage. Uh, but I, honestly, I had a very difficult time embracing that part of my identity. Um, in fact, I rejected being Asian until probably I was in college. So I could very easily see people saying the same thing about me. I could easily hear them say oh she's not really Chinese and that really bothered me because I felt like well you know what there is nothing nothing wrong with being Asian American and there is nothing wrong for this fortune cookie to be Asian American either and so I really wanted to do something that would give this American Chinese food more respect yeah. <laughs> with the hopes that if we can respect this American food with Chinese roots then hopefully it would give us a new respect for our fellow Americans with Chinese yeah. roots too. Yeah, because the food that we're eating, the the Chinese food in Chinese restaurants, uh, does have does have roots, but it is uh, presented and prepared in a way that is with access to the ingredients that we have here in the United States, just like your mother grew the vegetables because she was not able to get them. Um, I think but the restaurants had to exactly, the exactly same as, yeah, but know, the, the, the restaurants that... they they would have to adapt to whatever they had available um, at the at the time. So mm -hmm. I did read in your author's notes something that I thought was very beautiful, and that's what you said, which is what I hope this book does for my readers as well, which is to um, have an American Asian American identity and a lot of pride in that. Um, and it's nothing to be ashamed of or to scorn. Every Chinese dish served in an American restaurant has been adapted and changed. Yes, many do not have the flavors of traditional Chinese cuisine and are unlike what you might find in China, but Chinese American cuisine is the flavor of resilience, it's the flavor of adaptability, the flavor of persistence and triumph. Above anything, this food is the flavor of America. And that is absolutely beautiful. And it tells the story of what our 
the immigrant part of our country is. And you can say that probably about any kind of cuisine in any restaurant of any nationality across the United States. It doesn't matter if it's a, you know, a Polish restaurant or some of the Italian restaurants, which were probably Americanized Italian food, um, the resilience, the adaptability, the persistence and the triumph. So how did you do this with the Chinese food? What did you do? Because a lot of this book is stories. It's not yes. a lot of recipes. No, <laughs> there's only yeah. one recipe. And they're all, this is basically all the stories behind uh, the food. I like to say it's uh, a feast of stories. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, so I had that idea to do this book all the way back in 2004. But, you know, uh, I kind of c- came back and forth in my mind over and over the years. So all, all these years, I was just kind of collecting stories, you know, like I'd, my father would tell me a story and I kind of like scribble it down. I'd make a mental note. I'd see, uh, I'd see like a bad English translation of something and like kind of copy it, things like that. So I've been collecting these stories for years and years. Um, but you know, when, when we finally decided that we were going to publish this book, um, I realized that I needed to make sure that some of the things were a little bit more, I don't want to say historically accurate because it's a lot of myths and legends, but I want to make sure that they had real, real roots and not just stories that my father made up around the table. <laughs> so, um, so I actually hired a research assistant to help me find secondary and third sources for each of the stories I had found. Um, and uh, as I said, I was born here in the United States, um, so I don't read Chinese. And so this research assistant was able to read Chinese and contact uh, people in China to find out which stories were, were what, what was true about each story and get me different versions. So a lot of these stories are like two or three versions kind of smushed together. Uh, I tried to take the pieces pieces from each version uh and kind of so each one in some ways it's made a whole new version to talk about ad- uh, adapting <laughs> right right and i think it's neat you had the research assistant that uh went in a little bit deeper to make sure that what you were uh, talking about was uh you know representative of what you wanted to talk about and i love the way you did the table of contents like a menu <laughs> that we might find at a chinese restaurant you started with chopsticks and then tea, appetizers, soup, side orders, chef specials, and dessert. Yes. So <laughs> let's pick a chapter. Um, which one would you want to dive into a little bit more to give people an example of what we're talking about when we talk about uh, the legends and the myths behind these traditional dishes? Um, let's start with spring rolls. People seem to love uh, this story very much. Uh, so this story, uh, so everybody, n- most people I would think know what a spring roll is or have had a spring roll or at least have not have had an egg roll before. So spring rolls and egg rolls um, are related. They are different. The egg roll is much thicker and a lot bigger, um, but they are definitely related. Now, this in, the spring roll is the origin, I guess you would say, <laughs> the mother of the spr- of the egg roll. Now, the spring roll is called the spring roll because in in China, they eat it mainly in the spring during their festival. However, the name of the spring roll has nothing to do with the origin story. The origin story has to do with a Ming Dynasty minister who would get his work done faster than any of his colleagues. He got his work done so quickly that his colleagues got very jealous and were very suspicious. And they went to the emperor and they said, that minister is cheating. Somebody is doing his work. There's no way one person could get their work done that quickly. So the emperor was also very curious and called this minister to him and asked, how do you get your work done so quickly? And the minister then revealed his big secret. He said, actually, I have a special gift. He said, I can write with two hands. And because I can write with two hands, I can get my work done twice as fast. Now, of course, no one believed him. So the emperor said, all right, Here's nine boxes of records and go home, copy these nine boxes of records in nine days. If you can get it done, if you can really write with two hands, then you should be able to get it done. So the minister brought home these records and and he opened the boxes. He realized, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to work night and day, even with two hands. I'm not going to be able to stop and sleep or anything if I'm going to get this done. So he started working feverishly night and day, not sleeping, not eating. Now, 
this minister had a wife who was very, very worried about him, especially when they got to like day three. And she's like, you have to eat. And he's like, no, no, I, I can't eat. I can't stop. And she's like, I need both. I need both my hands to write. And she said, oh, then I'll feed you. And so she tried to feed him soup. She tried to feed him noodles, but they were too messy. And he always like said, no, 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 no. So finally, she, she decided to invent a new food, a rolled food that she could hold and he could bite off while his two hands were busy. And that rolled food was the spring roll. And that's what we eat today. Hmm. <laughs> amazing. That's amazing. And he just would take the bites. Both hands yep. would continue to be busy. And, you know, really, it is a beautiful little, um, and I like to think they're like encapsulated foods. Um, <laughs> all the good ingredients tucked inside. You hardly even get your hands dirty when you eat them. Mm -hmm, exactly. Uh, it's just such a delicious uh, thing. And sometimes I've seen them with, uh, um, sometimes they're not uh, cooked. Not, I don't mean not cooked, like there might be a rice yeah. paper or sometimes yeah. they're fried. And then also I think of things like pot stickers too, that are uh, dough, um, perhaps boiled, maybe pan fried, a similar yeah. type of thing where everything is like stuck inside. Now, do you have another story? For, I didn't look at the list of the appetizers for. Sure. Well, you brought up pot stickers. So I was uh -huh. like, oh, well, why don't I tell you that story? Because yes. that's also yes. quite popular. So, you know, in Chinese, in China, there's many. So that would many be the dumpling. Is that the dumpling yeah. story? Yeah, yeah. there's okay. many, many different kinds of dumplings. Okay. Uh, but the dumplings that we are probably most familiar with here in the United States are like are the pot stickers, mm -hmm. right? So those are the kind of the boat shaped. Right. Um, dumplings that we'll get as an appetizer or side order in a Chinese restaurant. Now, if you notice the shape of those dumplings, I just called them boat shaped, but you'll also notice that those dumplings are also in the shape of a person's ear. Hmm. And that was done on purpose because these dumplings were invented by an ancient Chinese doctor who invented them as a medicine to cure people's frostbitten ears. One winter, he was walking through his village and he saw all these villagers were suffering from frostbitten ears. So he went home and he created these dumplings. He filled these dumplings with warming herbs and spices and meats. And he thought if people ate these dumplings, it would warm them from the inside and cure their frostbitten ears. So he made them ear shaped to remind them what these dumplings were medicine for. And he went out and he gave them to all the people. Now, everybody ate them. They all loved them. I do not know if it cured anybody's frostbitten ears, but they loved them so much that we still eat these dumplings today. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. And uh, so good and so tasty and um, always a favorite thing to order when you get an appetizer <laughs> is to get some dumplings or some spring rolls. So let's talk about some of, what about any of the chef's specials? I think that's a part of the menu that some people are always, when we go out to eat, my husband is always attracted to that section of the menu. And uh, yes. whereas some of my kids might, you know, tend to like go towards some of the things that are maybe a little bit more um, traditional. Uh, what mm -hmm. about on the chef's special menu? Anything on there that you'd like to tell the story about? Sure. Uh, why don't I tell you the story of um, Peking duck? Yep. <laughs> because Sounds that good. is one of my favorites. And you can really only get that in a restaurant. <laughs> yes, it makes me and, think of the movie uh, Christmas Story. Oh, yeah. When the and, dogs eat the turkey. So they say, <laughs> we'll go out and we're going to have Chinese and they order a Peking duck and they have Thanksgiving dinner. Mm, with, uh, I, I bet you... And my own bias says, I bet you it was more delicious. <laughs> I probably was. Yes. Yes. So tell us about so, it. So traditionally, the Peking duck has to be cut into 108 slices. Now, nowadays it probably isn't, but the very, very traditional Peking duck was cut in 108 slices. And that is because sometime in the late Song Dynasty, after a big battle, um, a platoon of soldiers, 108 soldiers, well, 107 soldiers and its captain, uh, were returning home from a battle. And uh, they were very, very hungry. Uh, but it was a long ride home to the city. And as they were on, as they were tromping home, they stopped in a small village, it was a small village with only one restaurant. And they stopped at the restaurant and they said, we're hungry feed us. <laughs> and the restaurant owner was completely overwhelmed because he's used to very small, they lived in a small village, like I said, and he only had one duck, one duck to feed 
108 soldiers. And the captain said, if, if you don't feed these soldiers, they're going to be very unhappy. And nobody wants unhappy soldiers in, in their town. So the chef very skillfully had to cut that duck into 108 pieces so that each soldier could have a slice and each soldier could get something and leave not unhappy. <laughs> and he did. And so that is why the Peking duck traditionally was always sliced into 108 pieces. Amazing. Amazing. So those are really uh, fun stories. How do you envision or hope that when people buy this book that they use it? Do you like them to read it out loud, tell stories to their children, or is it something that you just envision people sitting down and absorbing uh, as they're reading it? Both. What I really hope is that they read it and they uh, that they take it, they read it, they start reading it, and that's, they say, oh my gosh, did you know? And they turn to the person next to them. They said, I have to tell you about this. And then they read it. And then the next time they see a, their, a child in their life, they're like, oh, I have to tell you. And then they read the story to them. So I really hope it becomes a book that is shared over and over and over again. And, every and I really hope that every time someone uh, eats Chinese food, they remember the story and it makes their food taste that much more delicious because I think it will. Yes, I think you're right. I think that when you know the story behind it and you know that uh, there is legends and myths and history behind the food, that it is uh, truly something that is uh, connected to your the Chinese uh, culture, but it is American and it is Americanized and uh, the people that run the restaurants do that you know, for a reason, but that's the beauty of it. Yeah, exactly. You know, I, I really, I really want to take out this idea that, um, that purity is better. <laughs> like, right. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't believe that, you know, like I, uh, the truth is, um, and I've said this to people before, like, I will never be complete, I will never be Chinese, right? And the truth is, I'll, but I will always be um, I will I will never be completely Asian, but I will always be Asian American. And there's mm -hmm. something really beautiful about that. And that's how I feel about this food too. Yeah. Yeah. I think that it um it deserves the that the respect because of that. So I think that those stories are great. Now, when you uh write children's books as well, are you using uh the your Asian background to write the stories also? Is this a common theme in your brand of your writing and your books? Uh, yes, very much yeah, so. So yeah. um, I, I I said early on um, how how when I was younger, I pretty much um, rejected my Asian heritage. So a lot of people think that like um, um, most of my books deal with Asian culture, Asian cuisine, Asian stories. So they're like, oh, she must know so much about Asian culture. Uh, the truth is, I don't really, um, because like I said, I rejected it when I was younger. Making these books have been my way of trying to learn all the things that I didn't learn when I was younger. They've been my way of trying, of, of claiming my own heritage. Uh, so that's why most, I would say almost all of my books deal with Asian culture, Asian cuisine, Asian stories in some way or the other. Nice. And uh, what is the one recipe that's in the Chinese menu book? <laughs> so the one recipe that's in in the book is my mother's scallion pancake recipe. Um, it's a very simple recipe, but I think it's a little deceptively simple um, because the ingredients are simple. Um, it sounds simple, but uh, there's a little bit of it's a little bit of. I don't think skill is the right word. But maybe it's a little bit of patience because you have to kind of roll the dough into a coil and kind of like coil it up kind of like a cinnamon roll and then kind of like roll it again. There's a lot of a lot of coiling and rolling. <laughs> yep. So that's neat to know. Um, and did she make those a lot for you? She did not, but she made them often enough that I remember it very vividly. I feel like I can I only remember us making it maybe once or twice. But it was so much fun, and I remember eating them right away. So uh, I don't think it was often, but enough that it made a very distinct impression on me. Yeah. So uh, writing and illustrating has been a huge part of your life, Grace. Would you be willing to talk a little bit about um, balancing living with writing and illustrating and how uh, you 
like to do that. Sometimes I think there's listeners that are always kind of curious about this. They're perhaps trying to do some balancing of writing and perhaps cooking cookbooks on their own. And um, I don't know if you have any tips or any rituals (laughs) or things as you head into your workspace or for your writing life. Gosh, you know, balance has always been something very difficult. And I think that there came a point where I just realized it was never going to happen. (laughs) That, that for me, I'm, I'm, I have seen, I have witnessed other people able to do beautifully with this balance thing. But for me, um, the best thing that ever happened to me was just to give up trying to balance and realize, you know, for me, it's just going to have to be right now. I'm focused all on this. And then when that's over, then I can focus on this and then I can focus on this. Uh, So, uh, and you know, I've been very lucky. My family is very understanding um, and they kind of understand that this is the way that I work. This is the way I am. I, that is always going to be one burner on and the pots take turn on that burner. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a great way to think about it. I think that I've learned over the years as I uh, work on creative projects that it is good just for me to focus on one. Yeah. Um, It's hard to write lots of books or draw lots of things at one time. Um, So the focus for me is something I've had to develop and hone. But underneath that, it is like a pot on one burner because the other burners might be on. But those are things that I need to do to care for myself, uh, care for my family, care for my home. And things that I don't want to go by the wayside while I have this other burner of a creative project going on. And uh, I think that's been the hardest thing for me to learn is other than those three burners, not to have like a ton of other burners going. And and when you're in a publishing uh, contract arrangement, perhaps, you know, with a traditional publisher, if you had an agent tradition, you know, and you're under contract, it is almost like everything else does have to go by the wayside, except those things that are foundational in your life. You know, self-care, making sure we uh, care for ourselves. And I think for writers too, um, our our bodies and our brains and our mind, I mean, that is the where all this creativity comes from and not letting that get uh, not cared for. And this creative project then, yeah, you do, right? So, but the creative project does have a way of like taking over. So just set your baseline for what you know you need to do underneath of all of that. Because it is true when you're on deadline for a book, it is, it can be almost feel like it's way off balance more than on balance. Yeah, I think for me, what I was trying to say, which I completely agree with everything you're saying, I guess I want to make sure I was clear about what I was saying is what was best for me was just to, relax and let go of trying to do it all yeah like trying to have all four burners go on at once and once I just said you know what that's just impossible you know it's okay one burner is on eight and the other are others are on one or two you know like it's it's fine and there's no other burners (laughs) when it comes to your drawing your illustrating your writing is there a time of day or night that is your like peak time? Um, you know, it changes every day. Uh, I I try to I get up very early, um, and I tr- and I try to do some exercise and get stuff done. Uh, so, like I would say, probably morning is the time I try to get most of the things done. Um, it, especially when my child's at school, like that's right. very helpful. <laughs> like, yes. So usually I get up very early. And, um, and when she is at school and then when she comes home, kind of things start falling apart (laughs) in terms of work. (laughs) Right. That's right. And I I think that it, uh, especially if they have needs, things they have to do for school that might require some assistance from a parent, it does um, end up being that way. So yeah, I think uh, morning is a great time. And I've heard that from a lot of uh, people who do in creative endeavors that morning is good for them. I have the best book though about daily rituals for people that are creatives. And it's really interesting to read because some people in this book were not like that at all. Like nighttime, like the dark of the night was like literally like their best time. And I, think I think if it, I didn't have a child like that goes to that's um, she's just about to start middle school, but elementary middle school child, I think night uh, before I had a child nighttime was much better. Yes. But you know, it's had to had to make the switch. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So it's a 
a, a life based on, you know, what's going on currently in your life. And I have to say now that my kids are older, sometimes I do hit my stride around 3.30 or 4 in the afternoon. And I think I could just keep on like working, you know, into the evening. I've yeah. made, I've made uh, feeding myself in a dinner time, you know, taking a break, such a big part of my life though. I, that's a habit that I would have to break, I think, in order to just like stro- stroll straight through the evening um, as not doing the things that I typically do ar- around dinner time. So what about advice um, in terms of publishing or agents? Anything for our listeners that you might like to add when it comes to the work that you do um, in the publishing space? Um, so. I would not, like I said, I started at, like in 1999 and before that, I mean, that's when my first book was published. So I don't have any good advice in terms of agents or like submissions because things were very different back then. Like that was before email. Yeah. <laughs> that was like, that was when I had, when we sent manuscript, it was like, you had to get it printed out at Kinko's. I don't know if anybody remembers what Kinko's is, <laughs> but you had to get it printed <laughs> out and send them like a big, uh, big envelope with a self-addressed stamped envelopes to get the manuscript back. So a lot has changed since I started. Uh, But I would like to, and this is probably something that that your listeners have heard many, many times, but, um, and because it is, it's almost, it is kind of cliche, but it is so true that, um, you know, there's no rush as, I mean, there's no rush just write. I mean, the truth is nobody makes books for the money. (laughs) Like if you want to make money, there are much, much easier ways to do it (laughs) and much less painful ways, much uh, ways that do not take as much rejection. (laughs) Like, like there are much, much um, better ways to, to make money. Uh, So you should be making books because you love it. Um, and so do what you love. There's a, there's a story, um, there's a story that's become kind of, a uh, very popular on the interwebs <laughs> about, um, about Jim Carrey and how his father, uh, wa- always wanted to be a comedian, but, uh, decided that that was not, that was not safe. You know, it was, so he decided to do the safe thing and become an accountant, but, uh, he failed at being an accountant and he ended up having to take a job as a gender, doing all these terrible things uh, to eke out a living. And his takeaway from that, which I've always thought about, was like, you can fail at something you don't love. So you might as well just fail at something you do. And so that's kind of what I would like anybody who's interesting interested in writing to remember um you know like i know that at least in my industry there's like oh vampires i gotta write vampires because that's so hot now it's like well do you love vampires you know like might as well fail writing something you love yeah yeah and your books um even the first one of a food theme with the vegetables now we have the you know the chinese menu book um and if and if and if people that are listening are attracted, obviously, to this space of food and cooking and ingredients, I uh, have an interview coming up with a woman that wrote a single subject book all about eggs. And um, <laughs> that sounds you know, fascinating. <laughs> right. And if people love and, if, you know, that's what she was living, that's what she loved and that's what she wanted to write about. And it's the yeah. same for all of us. And um, don't be afraid or shy away from that because the story that we tell, and it's, you know, this t- totally ties into stories that it's, no one can tell these stories like we can if it's a lived experience that we can uh, bring to the table and talk about and share to connect with other people, to help them, to entertain them, to inspire them, or to teach them something. Um, it's a it's a great way to do that. And stories and food, I think it's... And, infinite number of possibilities when it comes to what we could perhaps do. Definitely. No, no doubt about it. So um, let's get back to the book just for a minute. And as we're starting uh, to wrap up, what else would you like for us to know about this book or um, anything else you'd like to share from the book? Um, well, I just hope that people uh, get a chance to see it and read it. And um 
let's see if there's any, was there anything really burning that I would love to tell people about to end this off? I, you know, I think I will end this, this, this interview by telling you about the fortune cookie. Yeah. <laughs> because Since that's the like, one thing that people were like, oh, seems so disappointed that it wasn't yes, Chinese, right? It wasn't Chinese. And that's kind of what started this whole book anyway. And so, yes, the fortune cookie is not Chinese and it's not even Chinese American. It is actually a Japanese American invention um, that uh, unfortunately, because of the Japanese internment in World War II, the Japanese were not able to uh, exploit. So the Chinese restaurateurs were only too happy to take this invention and exploit it for their own. And uh, due to World War II, uh, the many soldiers went to eat at Chinese restaurants in San Francisco. And that is where the fortune cookie was invented. And they, while well, they were there, they had the fortune cookie, they loved it. And when they went back home to their hometowns in New York, New Jersey, uh, all, all over the country, uh, when they went to their Chinese restaurants, they'd ask for the fortune cookie. And of course, uh, Chinese restaurant tours were eager to please their customers and quickly found out what this fortune cookie was. And all of a sudden, everywhere in the United States, Chinese restaurants was ser were serving fortune cookies. And so uh, th that's the story of how fortune cookies became ubiquitous with Chinese food, even though it most likely is like 98% a Japanese <laughs> Japanese um, invention. Though there is a very weak 2% that it could be a Chinese American invention. And that story I put in my book, which I hope uh, people read. <laughs> yes. And you know, I think it's funny if you go out to eat Chinese food and you don't get a fortune cookie, it's almost like the meal is not even complete. Exactly. <laughs> And everybody loves to open them, read them. My daughter, even, I was looking at her phone case the other day. I don't know why she laid it on the counter, but inside the, it's a clear case. There's like three uh, fortunes from fortune cookies Aww. that she's had received at a restaurant over the years. And I think that's kind of a, a neat way that, you know, those fortunes speak to people. People love to get uh, the fortunes and fortune cookies. And I've been on the back. Some of them have like numbers, like lucky numbers. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And there was a story where like, 20 people won the lottery because of the numbers on Isn't the back. Isn't that something? <laughs> yeah. The other thing I think that was always neat at Chinese restaurants was you always knew uh, for the Chinese New Year what the animal was for the year. Yes. And it would lead to conversations around the table. Like you look at the year you were born, you would find out if you were what the animal was for the year you were born. And I think that uh, it's such a neat way of thinking and it's a neat way of uh, celebrating the Chinese New Year. And I don't know if that's an Americanized version of that or not. It, it, it's the Lunar New Year animals is completely it's a, definitely a Chinese tradition that's come over. So, yeah. yes, that's definitely uh, it definitely has roots in Chinese uh, history and tradition. So that's that's not made up at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's very neat. Yeah. So um, Crab as Ragoon is, but <laughs> <laughs> you know, we went to a, Ch a Chinese restaurant once, and when we walked in, there were several women over to the side, and I had never seen them doing this in the dining room, but they were actually hand rolling and making many of the uh, dumplings uh, that yeah. they, I guess, were going to use in the restaurant that day. And there's so much handwork that goes into it when it's something that people are making, um, mm -hmm. yeah, from scratch. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. So um, let's, uh, as we finish, I always like to ask my guests a question. Um, if you have a favorite cookbook, uh, what that cookbook is and why? Yes. So I have two, I, I came prepared. I have two favorite cookbooks. Um, so my first favorite cookbook is uh, Chinese Home Style by uh, my friend Maggie Ju. And I guess maybe that might be my, she was my one of my favorites because I know Maggie Ju very well. And she's, she's just such a great person. And if you ever see her blog, Omnivore's cookbook. It's just, uh, it's just mouth watering. <laughs> so this, this book, Chinese home style is great because what's really interesting about this, it's like, it's all vegetarian mm -hmm. and I, and vegan. So like it's taking these Chinese recipes and making it without the meat, making it without the, the meat products, which is quite a feat if you know Chinese cuisine at all, uh, but she does it so well and all the food still tastes delicious. So uh, this is one of my favorite. And the other favorite, 
Uh, this one is well used and well loved, especially when I wrote the book Chinese menu. It's called Chinese Takeout Cookbook. It's the chat. Oh, sorry, let me repeat that again. Chinese Takeout Cookbook. It's by Kwaklin Wan. And um, it's just basically all the food that you would get in a Chinese restaurant. And uh, he's kind of broken it down to how you can um, you can cook it at home. Uh, my favorite recipe is the chicken and sweet corn soup. Uh, it's just really delicious. And so basically what you could do is this book has a lot of the recipes that I tell the story of in my book, Chinese Menu. So you could take, you could pair Chinese Menu with the Chinese Takeout Cookbook and it would make a great holiday gift. <laughs> I think that's an excellent idea. And then you have the the legends and the stories combined with the recipes and it's the complete package. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm going to have to see about Kung Pao Chicken in his book because that is my favorite dish mm, to order when I go one. out. Uh, <laughs> my husband usually gets mushu pork. Ooh, and, that's good too. <laughs> uh, yeah, and you know the funny thing about a Chinese food, and I don't know if this is the way it's supposed to be done, but if you go, say there's a group of four people and we go out, everybody orders their own thing, but we always end up having leftovers. So is it intended to be a little bit more family style than we might traditionally order? Like, what if we only ordered three entrees? We could pass the dish and share, right? Yes. I mean, it's definitely supposed to be family style. Um, yeah. Traditional Chinese cuisine, you know, what we call the main dishes, like the Kung Pao chicken and stuff, that that's actually in traditional Chinese cuisine. Those are the side orders, right? It's yeah. supposed to be the, the rice is the main dish. And then you're supposed to just take a little bit of Kung Pao chicken and a little bit of, of, of string beans and you eat that with your rice. So yes, it's always been family style. And one of the big traditions, especially at Lunar New Year, is that you should have leftovers on the table because that means it's tr it, it symbolizes that you'll have more than enough to eat for the year. Like if there's no, if if all the food's gone and empty, it means that you might not have enough to eat for the whole year. But if there's leftovers, it means you'll be satisfied the whole year. You'll have more than enough to eat. So that's why, in general, um, there is leftovers. So can you tell us what it is about the rice? Like, why is the rice the centerpiece? Well, it's, it, the rice is the centerpiece in um, in southern China. Uh, in northern China, it's actually noodles. Uh, it's not so much as the centerpiece, but it's the fact that that was their staple food. You know, I see. Uh, that was... Uh, that, was that was the, the, fill, the filling fill. part of the meal? Yes, that was yes, the filling part you. of the meal. Okay, yes. Yes. Yeah. So and everybody was, always had rice. It was always served at the meal or perhaps always noodles. Then the other part was just like a little bit of something to put on the rice or the noodles. Yes. To make the rice, give the rice more flavor and make the you. rice more enjoyable. Yeah. So if that's the case, then we, I mean, ordering four entrees really is like way overboard. Yes. I mean, really the entrees should be like half the size. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. But, or you know, um, taking an opportunity to order a couple of appetizers, maybe soup. I read in here soup is also like a big thing. In yes. Soup is a really big part of Chinese cuisine. But you, some, you know, yeah. it's all changed here in the United States. Like I said, like the rice, which was the main part of the meal, it's a side order here. Yeah. And like the entrees, which were side orders are entrees and they're three times as big as, the, as they used to be. So and there's, like I said, there's nothing wrong with it. You just have to get used to that. This is the way you eat it here in that's the United right. States. That's right. That's right. And that that's the way it is. And that that's a good thing. And that this is American Chinese food. And that there's a lot of beauty in that um, yes. just in and of itself. Yes. Well, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show. I will link to Chinese Homestyle and the Chinese Takeout Cookbook, as well as your book, Chinese Menu, in the show notes. Why don't you tell everybody a little bit about how they can connect with you online? Sure. Um, the best way to connect with me would be to connect with me on Instagram at Pacey Lin, P-A-C-Y-L-I-N. And that connects to threads and uh, to my Facebook and everything like that. So that's the best way to reach me online. Or you could go to my website, which is gracelynn.com. And that has all the information about my books and it has uh, great videos for kids where I show them how to draw a Chinese dragon and all those things. Um, and oh, I also have these really great um, one minute myths where I sum up some of the stories in Chinese menu in about a minute. <laughs> so, uh, yes. Yeah, so please check out my website and, um, and you can go to any place that sells books, um, to find my books, uh, Barnes and Nobles in your local indie bookstore.
Yes, that's right. Okay, well, that's wonderful. And I can't thank you enough for coming on the show today. I know you're at the very beginning of this promotion process and you've been through this before with other books, but <laughs> I hope that you enjoy it. Um, enjoy. I always love getting to meet people that come out for these events. So I think that's a great time to connect with people, but I hope that you have um, a great time and much success with your new book. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, I'll, I'll talk to you later and um, we'll put all these um, links again in the show notes. So have a great day, Grace. Great. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for joining us today for this episode of the Cookbook Love Podcast. Again, all the links can be found in the show notes at www.cookbooklove.co. And if you are interested in writing a cookbook of your own, please check out the free cookbook writing masterclass called How to Get Paid to Write a Cookbook. It is designed specifically for food or nutrition experts. And you can check that out at www.cookbookwritersacademy.com slash free. So that's it for today's episode of the Cookbook Love Podcast. This is your host, Maggie Green. And until next time, have a great day and keep loving your cookbooks. Thanks for listening to the Cookbook Love Podcast. You can find out more information at www.cookbooklove.co.